Hey guys, we are today here for another episode of Collectors Anonymous. We have a big time collector, an action figure innovator. His name is Jeremy Padower. Thank you. How are you guys doing? What's going doing? on, man? Doing Dude, well. Dude, I'm glad to be here. I'll tell you what, I, uh, I've seen a lot of your content. I was thrilled to be asked to be here, man. I, uh, as a longtime collector, respect a lot of the stuff that you're up to. And, and uh, given the opportunity to be here with you, I was totally psyched too. That's awesome. And, you know, the, the respect is right back at you because uh, I was a really big collector of uh, re wrestling action figures as a kid. And I'm sure I've collected maybe one or two of uh, the action figures that you were actually a part of. And I think that that's like really crazy to be talking to somebody um, that like shaped my childhood in a way. <laughs> oh, man. You, it's hard to even say how much I shaped your childhood because I made, uh, let's see, over the years I've made uh, Pokemon, Dragon Ball, yep. Yu Gi Oh! Uh, God, I, Halo, Micro Machines, He Man. That's crazy. Uh, just keep on going. Roblox, Fortnite, like yep. just keep going. Man. Yeah, keep that's going. amazing. How did you how did you like fall into like toy producing and manufacturing? So I my, I'm a lifelong collector yeah. uh, from the earliest days. I grew up in Me in Memphis and I also lived in Mississippi. So I didn't like have great access to this stuff. I just I had a, a real passion for it. And I followed my passion down two different paths. One was academic. Uh, I, I, so I did a, a, all the, you know, did a JD MBA, I did graduate programs and stuff like that. But the other was just pure collector. And I uh, never stopped collecting. And uh, in, in the mid nineties, I started, uh, I realized that I hated law school, hated it. I was like, this sucks. I'm never gonna be a good lawyer. I gotta figure out a way not to have student loans because I was paying for school. Right. And uh, and so I, start, I I was watching TV one night, like 1996, 1997, and this lady was talking was about six. how she was, <laughs> she was yeah, you're six, that's awesome. She was talking about how she was making money uh, by creating websites and selling ad space. So I was like, eh, I'll do that. <laughs> so I started uh, learning a little bit about HTML and I created some websites essentially where you could buy and sell on a series of guest books, collectibles. So Beanie Babies and Furby. But the way I was able to get people there is that Yahoo was a brand new search engine, 1996. And it was only an alphabetical list. So I knew like looking at the phone book, that if you had two A's at the beginning of any category, yeah. you'd show up first. So I named everything that I did with two or three A's, absolute Beanie Babies, absolute this, absolute that. And after about six months, I had 20,000 people a day coming through. I actually and, uh, remember thought, hearing <laughs> that. I actually remember hearing you say that before. I think that <laughs> that was uh, a very interesting way to innovate your, your space in early internet days. And it was really cool because being a consumer at the other end, we had AOL dial-up internet. And yeah. it was very, very slow and you could only do like a certain thing, a few certain things that were actually cool. And one of them was going on early eBay and yeah, and it was, uh, it was, I, I tried to buy like a lot of stuff on early eBay and back then they didn't have the proper system no. that they do now. And I got ripped off a lot of times. I was so upset. Do you remember how, do you know how eBay started off? Um, not vividly no i just remember using they, it they started off by selling pez dispensers <laughs> they, <laughs> that's and, awesome and they scaled from there they scaled that's from crazy there. and and the one thing that i would just say like you know help drop a little bit of knowledge because i'm a little bit older is that that's just the way life is man you can like for me the academic stuff was very linear but everything else was not linear at all and I would say, no matter what you're doing in life, do a little bit that is conforms and a little bit that's completely off the grid. Right. You don't know which side is going to hit. The conforming side is so that you hedge your bets a little bit. Yep. The non-conforming side is so that maybe you'll hit a home run. Right. But even if you do conform, even if your job or career is completely on the grid, we're in a world now where a little bit can be wild west. Like you should, if you have the, if you have that wild hair, you should spend a little bit of your time doing, doing something crazy. That's the way I look at it. Right. Right. And I think that 
the risk takers are the ones that are ones getting things done you know um i worked a nine to five for a long time and it was you know i don't know i went to college i dropped out of college i went to college for uh networking and um I can't remember. I had a minor. Uh, <laughs> I, it was so long ago. I was only in school for actually like five semesters, so like barely two Good. years. And long it was enough to know, long enough to know whether you wanted to be there or not. Yeah, I had did a couple internships. I was handling uh, uh, Moundsview School District's network. It was a local school district here in Minnesota, and yeah. it wasn't it wasn't as glorious as you know, everybody made it out to see him and I thought it was going to be a lot more fun. And I'm like, I'm smart, but I'm not, you know, innovative where I'm creating entire network formats where people are on the forefront of creating this type of stuff. I'm over here. Yeah. That's asking, you, you know, people who, if your router got plugged in correctly, you know what I'm <laughs> saying? Like, I didn't, I didn't so, want to do that forever. And so I quickly dropped out and I, I moved around, did a lot of jobs. And then I finally like fell into gems and jewelry. And then from there, gems and jewelry is what really took off for me. Um, I hit the jackpot, bought some parcels, ended up selling those parcels for a lot more than what I paid for them because wow. it was a, a new and super limited find or in Africa or okay. Afghanistan, That's you know, fascinating. and That's so interesting. That's where wow. I that's where my collecting for like serious things came from. Like as a kid it was collecting toys and you know Pokemon cards and Yu-Gi-Oh cards and stuff like that. But as an adult like collecting things it it started with gems and then it blew up. Well that's so, that's so interesting cuz you hear something like that and you think like nah, like with me, I made a lot of money in the 90s and early 2000s with domain names. You hear stuff like that and you go like, no one's making money with jewelry parcels. No one's making money with domain names. Right. No one's making money with this stuff. But guess what? They are. They definitely are. People are doing it. I think uh, I think that's important to point out as well is that they're, the beaten path doesn't mean, doesn't guarantee success. You know what I'm saying? No doubt. No doubt. It's that, it's the hustle that, the hustle is a huge indicator of success. Yep. And frankly speaking, it's the hustle and, and how well do other people want to play with you? Like, do they want to be in the sandbox with you or not? Yep. If they don't want to be in the sandbox with you, it's it's tough. It's very, very tough. No doubt about it. Yep. I think it's I think it's cool, though, to see, you know, people swing from trees, per se, and then get to where they're going, and they didn't have to walk one, one yep. second, you know? Yep. And so that's that's really cool and I think that that's important for anybody who's listening or watching that you follow I I think you should have like what you said have one foot in and one foot out because it's oh it, it, it's you know you're you're having you're having bets on both places and if one takes off you can let go if you want to on either side you know and no I think it's still it's still very cool that you know people do the conforming side because I know a lot of people who have done that and are extremely successful people, not only financially, but like yep. critically and emotionally successful. Well, you know what I'm saying? And that's, that's where it has to be for me at the end of the day. It has to be fulfilling. You know what I'm saying? Right. So like have right. a passion after like, to like get up and like, you know, be like ready that's for right. it. Well, and look at it, it suits, it suits their personality too. Right. And, and it really is. You just got to do the things that fit you. Like, uh, you know, if you've got that, if you've got that, um, wild hair, but you also, um, don't want to risk it all, um, you can do both. If you've got that wild hair and you just have that, I don't care what happens and I'm going to make it happen no matter what, then I know which side you need to try because otherwise you'll have regrets. Yep. And I think that, I think collecting, you know, to me, collecting is a lot like that because when you're when you're collecting and when you're creating a collection um probably you're doing it because you're passionate about it and probably you're doing it because you see their secondary market value to it and uh and that's you know that's what's brought us both here today anyway it's probably a mixture of both you know what i'm saying and i think that everybody wants to to spend a lot of money and be safe 
You know what I'm saying? And like not have it go down the toilet. And I think that that's as about as far as I go with, you know, the the numbers part of it. Just because I think I it was it was really crazy. I was thinking to myself, you know, oh I could have bought, you know, all first edition commons, you know, and paid ten thousand dollars and I could have made two hundred thousand dollars. But I was over here buying stuff that I liked. You know, like that poster behind me. I was buying like weird, unique stuff that I like that doesn't sell very well that I think was really cool. And I have no regrets now. And I think it's better because you can't have regrets when you're collecting. I don't, and at, at whatever level you're at, like, and any beginner, I think, you know, I, coming into this yeah. market, this fucking climate should just hold yep. the storm because it's it's worth it and the fulfillment that you feel from it is is really cool to know that your 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 money is safe in in a piece of cardboard that you enjoy that's something to like be interested in about because like that that what that's that doesn't come along very often where you can physically hold something and it's valuable what is that like yeah. co- like uh gold and silver you know what i'm saying yeah and some of this stuff is worth more than gold and silver by weight, like a lot, like by oh. astronomical amounts, you know. And I, think, I have no question about it. I think and, that and it's have an, cool. You have an emotional attachment to it. Yes. And that's the difference. Yep. You know, it's hard to feel an emotional attachment to a block of anything. To a block um, of gold. Yep. That. You're exactly right. I don't. I. I just never really felt an emotional attachment to that. But yeah. like, it's just purely transaction. Really right trendy. exactly exactly it's a it's a it's a whole it's a checks and balances type of piece you know over here you know i get to buy a pack or buy a box i get to open it i get to open the packs i get to pull the card i get to send it to psa oh, get the awesome. 10 back <laughs> you know like that's the the feeling is indescribable it really is uh, you're right there's a there's a level of like First of all, your emotional connection to the underlying brand. Yep. Secondly, there's an experience. It's almost there's also like this lottery element to it where yep. you're you're kind of legally gambling sort of, but not really because you're paying you're paying for a chance uh, at getting something that might have more value. Like all of that yep. stuff, it just hits on so many different levels that it just it makes investing in cards way more satisfying than most other areas i mean like let's put it this way you invest in a stock um you have all the indicators uh of what that company may bring or may not bring but it's it's super far out of your control whereas if you're investing in something like cards you can control whether to open the pack or not uh you can control um, whether to submit it to PSA or not. There's a lot, uh, it, it feels a lot more entrepreneurial in that there's like, you are your own boss and you're in control of what happens next. Yep. And with Pokemon, I think, you know, coming from like the, the gem and jewelry industry, um, it, it felt, you know, like a hand in a glove. Cause oh, yeah. a lot of, That's a lot awesome. of the stuff is the same, same exact way in that industry and the communities that, are you know surround them and i think that it's very very important to know your surroundings and that's why the community in pokemon and in gems and jewelry like is very very important to me i like to be able to you know have a conversation with anybody from the topest level down to somebody who's just trying to get into it you know and has two dollars to rub together like i absolutely i don't care i think every yeah. part is important and i will spend as much time as needed on each part and well, I, think, I think and i think that's the thing about collectors is that collectors look at these situations and we're not very judgmental yep. uh like we don't like i don't look at other people's collection and go oh, that's small or that doesn't have a lot of value to it it's more yeah. of a philosophy than it is anything else you're like that's cool this person gets it they understand that that piece of cardboard has value they're subscribing to that belief and we're part of the same clan. I mean, yep. that's the way I look at it. It transcends everything else. It's a philosophy and it's just, it's great. It brings a lot of people together. Yep, it really does. Pokemon, it being, I don't know, it's, I feel Pikachu as like 
uh, a figure is more well known around the world than almost anybody. Michael Jordan think, and any international pop star you could think of. Like, well, yeah, it's no, crazy. I, I fully, fully agree. I fully agree. I had a drink of drink that I'm not trying to get sponsored for. <laughs> I, I need to get like a nice forever collector flask. <laughs> you yeah, know exactly. what I'm saying? And then pour all my drinks for the podcast into that. <laughs> uh-huh. That's how the big boys do it. They don't do any like product placement, you know? They like pour, they have like a nice brand name thing for their own stuff, you know? I think it's cool. Oh, that's awesome. I yeah. love that. I love yeah. that. Smart. It's really smart. But yeah, I just I don't know. I think uh, I think it's really cool to talk to someone like you that you know understands where like the nostalgia and being an adult and like creating experiences for other for not other for children that were much younger than you. I think you know tells a lot about your character, and I think that you're really in touch with your inner child and what you know people like. And I think that's what's parts, you know, made you successful. And I think that's very, very important that you hold on to that, dude. Like, I watch all your social media oh. stuff. You're so goofy <laughs> and you're so chill and relaxed <laughs> and fun. You know what I'm saying? And, and as we get older, I think that, you know, we lose some of that a little bit. And, <clears throat> you know, collecting you can... stuff from our childhood, I think, keeps that that barrier a little bit smaller and I you know I think there's always supposed to have a good relationship and especially if you have young children I mean you said you have young children so yeah it, like my kids they love Pokemon like they're all about me that's being great. into Pokemon and that's an experience I get to share with them and then they get to share with their children like look what I did with my dad you know no, it's, it's a beautiful thing honestly it allows it allows a multi-generational uh similar interests i mean especially during something like covid you know where you're stuck yep. you know that and uh it gives you the opportunity to sit down and cross uh generations i mean even you and me like i'm i'm older than you yep. and uh but it gives us something of commonality to talk about yep. you know whether we like the same music or whether we go to the same place to grab a burger we probably do Yep. It doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. I it feel matters like we have similar taste, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, I know. I mean, if I told you, if I told you my favorite fast food, I'm pretty sure we have the exact same. But, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. But, but you know, I mean, I just I like the commonality, and I do. And I think that when you find commonalities, um, that's one of the healthiest things that humans can do, yep. because uh, we tend to separate on so many things. We're like, everything we're, we're sports pre-programmed yep. to do. Right. My favorite sports team is this. Oh, you suck. You know, yep. <laughs> exactly. It's like, okay, well, do you really just because, but we're both interested in football. So how do you really suck? And that's one of the beautiful things. That's one of the beautiful things behind a brand yep. is that there's no, there's no like you suck, you suck. It's like, we all like it. We're all in it together. Yep. And that's, that's it's like cool. liking Nike, you know, nobody, nobody's talking shit on Jordans. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> 100% right. 100% everybody right. likes that and everybody can become pals over Jordans, you know? And I think that that's, that's really cool to have in a lot of different things and all these other markets and you know, communities especially are popping up. Like I started joining a few like Minnesota sneakerhead groups like that you oh, mentioned. Cool. Yeah. And um, I think that that's, that's actually pretty cool too. Cause like these people collect sneakers, like it's Pokemon cards and some of this stuff, like they have like uh, checks and balances, like to authenticate the shoes. And I think that that's very, very important because I like, as for me, like I like collecting things that are authentic and I'm not really like, oh, uh, like a replica collector. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm not going to go and buy a movie prop. That's a collectible or uh, a right. replica. I'm going to go buy the actual prop from the movie and that's it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, totally. totally. I, I totally get it. And that, but that again, that's, that's the mentality of someone that understands the value of collecting. You know, you do, you're not going to go out and buy the mass produced print where there's, you know, 25,000 of them. You're going to go out and find the original. Um, yep. And even if it's not the exact original, uh, you'd rather have an original from something else because you know that that's there's value there. There's like real value there. 
Yeah. And it's just, I think that it's more, uh, it's more like the, the sentimental and emotional attachment that I can have to it. You know, like you can't have an emotional to something that you know, isn't actually authentic, I think, you know? And yes. I think that the, the understanding the value of the originals is super, super important to go along with that because then you're getting best of both worlds. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about it. Yeah, definitely. I've, uh, I've been, my, my desk is a little bit of a mess. I have like a really big, uh, sorting pile I'm going through. Oh, dude, what's going on there? So what, what are you, uh, are you submitting these for? Uh, oh, look at that. That's gorgeous. It's actually personalized to my wife, Abby. That's her favorite Pokemon. And how did you come across uh, the artists? Um, so, um, I've I haven't been to any of Arita signings personally, but um, I've been getting cards signed for years. And oh, wow. this was this was from last fall from an event that my brother had um, in Norway. One of my is that a Shadowless? Yeah, it's a Shadow. I have two of them. Wow. Boom, and they're both signed and sketched. Oh my god! And now, why why aren't those why aren't those graded? Uh, cause I I'll show you some binders, bro. I have binders and binders of cards. Cause like I like the I like the raw cards as well. I mean, like you pull it out of the pack, you know, not in a slab already. Great, <laughs> you pull it out right. of the pack raw, and it like when you have that card in your hand and it feels, you know, I like that. I like that a lot. So like I still have like oh. a ton of cards that are in the binders. I have like ton of raw cards that I'm like just now trying to like get submitted. Like these are both signed oh, as well, based at Venusaur and the reprint. Amazing. I definitely I like a lot of the. Ooh, here's something that you know. Oh yes, that's a that's Top Sun. That's the second. That's the second grouping of Top Sun. So that that has a green back, right? Boom. There you go. Yep. Nice. That's bro. why. That's why nice. I like your uh, collection because it's like, uh, it's all the top some stuff that like not a lot of people even realize exists. Oh, I love you that. You know what I I'm saying? That. And like I was that's a huge the, fan of all the card ass stuff and all the sealed ass stuff too. Like Bandai, they created a lot of cool shit and not a lot of people even realize it. They did. There's no doubt about it. I'm they, trying to find. Did. I have this monster card that I pulled. I have a. I have a few sealed packs too from boxes that I've participated in breaking and how did you uh how did you um decide to go into pokemon and collectibles like that uh versus something else okay so it was like a few years ago and um so the gems and jewelry was going really really amazing you know i had a lot of liquid me and the wife were enjoying you know extras in life and stuff and um we just started buying the new Pokemon cards because the kids were bugging us about Pokemon cards. And so we are like, oh, whatever. And my wife plays Pokemon Go. So, oh, cool. you know, so she's still keeping that Pokemon, you know, drive alive. And nice. then, I don't know, I think we bought some po- uh, first edition fossil packs. And that was my biggest set as a kid. And so we opened them and I pulled the legendary birds out of them, hollow. And... And, you know, like the fucking, my heart was this big, you know, and it was crazy. So we started buying boxes and started buying more packs and singles. And then I was spending five figures, you know, every couple of weeks on Pokemon all of a sudden. And wow. I needed to get an outlet to like, just get some returns back. Cause there was stuff that I didn't want anymore that are, you know, to other stuff that I was learning about. And then now I really wanted that. So I would cash out and then go buy that. And I think the evolution of my collecting is really insane. Cause I've gone from like, I collect master sets. I collect graded cards, raw cards, boxes, packs, blisters, unique boxes, collectors, boxes, theme decks, um, all a bunch of different other uh, sealed products and stuff like that. I just, I really, really enjoy them because I don't know. It's, 
that was the product that I saw on the shelf as a kid. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And so like I, I you didn't see the single card on the shelf. So like sealed product is like my main focus. You know. Yeah. But I have tons. Absolutely. I cool. I have a few thousand slabs. <laughs> well, look in the next. In the, in the next 10 minutes, do you have any more uh, questions for me or anything I can answer? I have, uh, I want to, I want to hear your thoughts on this. This is my monster that I uh, pulled. Oh, that's awesome. That We're waiting incredible. for PSA yeah. to start grading these. So when they do, you know, I'll be on the first train. It's interesting. I don't know why they don't grade. They don't the... grade these. I was so upset. I was like, look at this card. It's a monster. This needs to be yeah. in a slab. Yeah. There's no question. Because it's BGS a sticker card. as well. So, like, this is super, it's, like, way softer than a regular card, you know? So, it's way easier to damage. B BGS grades those. BGS does grade them, but I uh, I like it. I like PSA slabs better. They're just more sleeker. And it's off-center. Yeah. So, like, I'm not trying um, to get hosed. <laughs> somehow, somehow uh, we need to convince them because uh it's really it really weird i don't understand you know their methods because like they grade very certain stuff and then like they don't grade other stuff and then they grade this error but they don't grade that error and both errors are prominent enough to be recognized you know right and i don't know it's really weird but none of these other like uh, bgs is like the only company that's like the most descriptive and that actually label that puts on their labels like what right. it actually is like even with cgc the new kid on the block that everybody's like you know hyping up all they actually put on their labels is error so you still <laughs> have to decipher what the error is and it's like it should be yeah. right there front and center so we know so the buyer the uh, collector the seller they all know what they have you know what i'm saying yeah, and i think exactly. that's the whole reason why we grade cards so you know what you have I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I think BGS is a little bit looser in terms of the way they go about things, and it would be, yeah, it would be nice if they. Uh, but do you do you believe in the other card grading services like C, whatever it is? CGS CGC. Um, I CGC. do. I do believe that they have uh, some value and credibility there because they did all like the comic book stuff. But I've been yeah. hearing like some really concerning things as of late and not, you know, um, I'm not really going to try to get into that because I'm not trying to throw shade at anybody. And I think that they're yeah. still a very valid, you know, grading service. And eventually, maybe once they get their kinks worked out, they would be just as big as a player as the rest of them. Uh, right. But as of right now, they're still selling like a little bit less than their other counterparts, you know, within the grading systems. But yep. I do feel that they're a little bit stricter than PSA, but not as much as BGS. Because I've seen, you know, like BGS, uh, they've slipped very, 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 very few. But I've seen a few more cards slip in CGC and, of course, PSA. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, 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 I can totally see that and understand that. Yeah, but yeah. BGS is definitely like if if it if I know it's if it's sports, I guess sports I grade with BGS pretty exclusively. Um, but if I know it's gonna be a black label or if I'm going for the moon on the black label, then I send to BGS because we all we all can agree that a BGS black label should be worth more than a PSA ten. Oh, totally, totally, yeah. and 100%. so. When, when a card's that perfect, that's when I send it to BGS because they recognize that really perfect, perfect card, you know? Oh, yeah. No, they do. They absolutely And they're, do. the black label, I don't know, is probably one of the most ingenious marketing schemes they could have done because, you know, how many people like I know, like, that, that's what they talk about. You know what I'm saying? Like, a black it labels, bust. black labels, black labels. And, like, that, the words, them. you know, black labels, like, just on, by itself, it's just enticing. You're, like, you're, you're listening all of a sudden, you know? And I think it's uh, a very, very cool thing that they did because now it completely stands apart from any other grading service, you know? And no anybody question. else who does that is really biting off of them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so what are, uh what are you trying to collect right now? That's one of my questions. Uh, what are you going right after now, right now? Yeah, man. I'd say I am focusing primarily on uh, five areas. Uh, one is the the first edition base set. Yep. Love those. Always open to getting those at the right value. 
Two is the uh, Trainer decks A and B, which they Ooh. sold that same year, which yep. basically were the the way that they were training kids at the individual card shops yep. on how to play Pokemon. And so yep. those de those decks and those cards were thrashed, and they're very rare. Yep. And I'm really happy to have collected a few of those. Uh, probably probably have the best collection in the world of those, to be honest. I mean, not tooting my own horn. It's just really solid collection. That's crazy. I think the value of those long term are going to go way up. Yeah, uh, definitely. Not hollow Blastoise is super, super sought after. Oh, it's crazy. Uh, three is the uh, 95 Top Sun cards. And uh, I just recently finished the PSA 10, all PSA 10 hollow set yep. of the 95. That's insane. Uh, Insane. I There's saw that actually. Card. That was crazy. That, <sighs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's it's not that many cards, so thankfully, you know, it's yeah. not like a journey to the, the end of the world and back. But no, still, I mean, to complete that is just astronomical because those some of those cards are single digits. Yeah, dude. There's only uh, I think that the the average pop is like ten. Yeah. Uh, across sixteen cards. Um, it's a nightmare to collect. I and mean, really, I mean, there's only one other person that I know has a full PSA 10 collection of those 16. Yep. And I just don't know. I mean, I think maybe one or two more people could put one together. Yep. But man, that would be tough. It's just exceptionally like the Vaporeon has a PSA of seven. And uh, getting my hands on that, it was very expensive, but worth it. Um, I think any Charizard and Pikachu prior to 2000. Uh, to me is like next level great and uh and then finally um i think uh um i'd say that you know I, i'm loving the uncut sheets especially the oh the older, man my favorite stuff i'm i'm really really sad i lost that auction for tcas oh which one which one the shadowless uncut sheet how much did that end up going for Thirty six thousand. I would have, wow, I, I would have paid double. <laughs> How, in the world? How in the world did that only go for thirty six? Uh, I think it's because it got overshadowed by PWCC one million percent, but and it was yeah. weird, and the reason why I missed it is because I thought it was going to be ending almost in conjunction with PWCC, you know, either the day before or the day after, but it ended the Friday before. Oh my gosh, he can't. I, so, I don't know. Do you think he, it was really, he, really he weird? He can't. He can't be thrilled about that one. Oh, there was a TCA. He, I love that dude the best. Rusty oh, yeah. is amazing. He's an amazing person, and it sucks because like a lot of that stuff, I personally would have paid double. You know what I'm saying? Oh, Just yeah. because a lot of that stuff it went for super, super, super cheap. Oh. Gosh, I just I I lost. I mean, personally, I lost focus that it was even out there. Yeah, yeah. and the Shadowless oh, Uncut oh, Sheet oh. has seven Shadowless Charizards in it, bro. That's <laughs> unbelievable. No, truly, that's unbelievable. Like that's it's wow, it's a Shadowless Hollow Sheet. You know what I'm saying? So there's seven Charizards on that sheet alone. Oh Blows my, my mind. Yeah, it's and Uncut Sheets I think are one of my favorite things. I'm my homie, he wants to sell me uh, a hollow fossil first edition, but that's one of the more common uncut yeah. sheets. And I should have bought it a long time ago, but I was always looking for like the rare stuff. And yeah. so I never did. And now, you know, they're asking like 6,000 a piece for it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need I a love, storefront. I, I need a storefront so I can just read all this shit off as advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. no, you're so right. That's hilarious. Well, my friend... I uh, I just have a few more minutes, and I I really have enjoyed chatting with you today, man. This That's, has been awesome. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you coming on to the show. Um, I think a lot of people have a lot of um, a lot of want to hear someone like you speak because you but, have a lot of knowledge. You. You're older than a lot of other. Uh, uh, you're older than a lot yeah, of us other cats, dude. I'm older than all <laughs> of you guys. <laughs> yep, and so I think there's a lot of good insight to be had there, and I think it's very important to always explore all parts of any collectible, newer, older, bolder, you know, shyer, whatever. Yep. And I think it was it was really a blessing for you to come onto the show. So I really oh, appreciate thank you, you, you giving well, me the time. Well, thank you for thank you for everything you're doing for the hobby and 
and uh, really appreciate your uh, your openness and and uh, man, I just think if the the next generation is like you guys, then we're gonna be in good shape. Yeah, I really appreciate that, man. Thank you for uh, yeah, stopping pleasure. in, giving us uh, a little point of view on Collectors Anonymous. Yeah, man. Have a good one, bro. Thank right, you so then. much. All right, All right brother. Peace. Thank you.